That's why you call it a dog. <laughs> That's something I've not heard in 50 years. <laughs> yeah, this is me and my sister out in 1955 or something with my dad. It starts with me and my sister and my daddy and mother and grandma and grandpa and great grandma and grandpa just uh, went up the family tree. Some pictures were gotten, some have not. My name's John Antelope Phillips. I grew up here in Madison County. I live in the same place I was little, when I was a little boy. I farmed when I grew up with the, with the old folks and uh, later bought myself a sawmill and uh, done a lot of carpenter work. Built several log homes and uh, done a lot of odd jobs, anything to buy bread and pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, so did your parents grow up here too? Or you... I'm a, my mother, she was born on about uh, two miles from the state line on a place called Roaring Fork. And, and my dad then, he was born about uh, a thousand feet from here on the head of Long Branch. Never did move out anywhere. So what did they do? Did they farm? Uh, they was just grew up poor. And the, my mother was, um, grew up back on the, in the mountains and they made what to eat. And said she never didn't know if there'd been a depression until she started going to school and reading about it. <laughs> Made everything you eat anyway. Yeah, so I guess it wasn't as hard a time then uh, because they were pretty isolated, I guess. Yeah, back there, and this major didn't go to town once a year to pay their taxes or buy uh, stuff, things to wear. But most of us live back in the mountains and uh, uh, without any income. Maybe maybe a couple of hundred dollars in, uh, at Christmas time when they take a little tobacco on the wagon to Greenville or Iceville. Couldn't make enough, uh, just a, s a small patch or something with a mule, enough to make a thousand pounds or something, a little wagon load. Yeah. Uh, my grandpa bought this in 19 and, and uh, 20, 100 acres from Hardwick Grooms. And he moved to East Fork and put him up a store over there. And he uh, uh, died in 19 and 47 and left it to the, to the street children. And so the, the old barn and the houses rotted down and I had my, my sawmill, so I built back four or five barns and the houses so they kept the place going. Yes, my grandma was an invalid and my uh, dad and mother was 30 year old when I was born. So everybody left with me and I was too conscientious to leave. So I just stayed with the old folks and helped make the crops. and. Never did uh, have any life of my own much. Never get married or have a family of my own. Just stayed here and keep, sort of kept the home fires burning. Got wood and such for the old folks and kept take care of them. I've been here myself now for 20 years. So this is your family album you put together? Yeah. Took me a couple of years. Me and my dad, we go around and get uh, different pictures from people and. Uh, most of them was little small pictures and I uh, take them and have them enlarged at a place at Mars Hill and eight by tens and put them together and got me about a hundred pictures of the old folks and my family tree back for six generations. Yeah. Well tell me about the, this photo. Uh, that's my dad taking about, I put, I guessed at a lot of the dates I might be a year or two off of some of them but as close as I could and that's my dad with a guitar and a, and a great uncle, uh, James Harrison Norton, that uh, was born here on Laurel, and uh, he got killed in a truck wreck about 1972 at Mars Hill. He was a good fiddle player and banjo player. This man was buried back in the mountains maybe 100 years ago, and his family left out and went into the north to get jobs. And uh, The woman retired, and she come in and went See if she could find her dad's grave, and it was growed grow up in a kind of briar called green briars. They'd grow 100 feet tall into the, the timber. 
she run up with her, called her brother and told her, told him about, couldn't find her daddy's grave and he got him a shovel and a hole and went and dug him up a rose and tucked with him and found his daddy's grave and cleaned it off and planted the rose. Many years have passed, I'm sorry to say, since I've been to visit my daddy's grave. When I spoke to my sister, these words she said, green briars are growing on our daddy's grave. So I went to the place where my daddy lay and saw the green briars growing up through the clay. So I took me a spade and I took me a hole, cleared away the green briars Planted daddy a rose. In life, dad's a briar and mom's are the rose. But in death, there's no difference. God only knows. Sometimes at midnight when the cold wind blows, I think of the graveyard and my daddy's rose. So I go to the place where my daddy lay and saw the green briars growing up through the clay. So I took me a spade, and I took me a hole, cleared away the green briars, planted daddy a rose. I long for the springtime when the rose will bloom, and cast its shadow on my daddy's tomb. So listen, good people, do these words I say, keep the green briars off of your daddy's grave. So I went to the place where my daddy lay and saw the green briars growing up through the clay. So I took me a spade and I took me a hole, cleared away the green briars, planted daddy a rose. Daddy's Rose. On the left that's, that's my dad, uh, around 19 and 50. That's his, uh, John B. B. Studson Hat was, was bought in 19 and 36 in Marshall. He went to Asheville to get him a, a set of uh, check lines for his mules and uh, come up a quick st storm. And uh, you can see the rain on the hat and he went to the bus station. They had a little camera set up for six photos for a quarter, and he put the, his quarter in there and got six photos. <laughs> I still have that hat. That hat's about 85 years old. My mother's Ava Shelton uh, on the right. Do you know when that was taken? Uh, about 1940, I'm mm -hmm. estimating. My mother, she was born on the place called Rowan Fork, about five miles from here, and lived there. She got about 10, they moved into uh, Sam's Creek and above Flag Pond, and about 1940, they moved down to Flag Pond, and then uh, 46 or something, she moved up on Rice Creek, and then married in 1947, moved back here to Long Branch. My mother lived 83 years and 10 months, my dad lived 84 year and two months. And never just all just uh, farmed a little, never working on any public jobs anywhere. Now this is my my dad's the daddy and mother, Spurgeon Phillips. And that's, uh, my dad was born in 19 and 19, so he, he was about six months old, looked like, so I guess the uh, picture be taken uh, uh, 19 and 20. Is that, was there a farm near here on this place? This is the farm where we, where we grew up and done all the work. So who bought this farm originally? Uh, my grandpa bought it in 1920. Spurgeon Phillips. And so you, everybody just stayed on the same property? Yeah, 19 and, and 25 it didn't rain for 20 weeks here in Appalachia. And no, nobody made any crops so I, that's what I, I come a lot of fellas to leave out and go to hunt timber cutting jobs. And, uh, there's uh, timber cutting jobs at Shelton Law, Pensacola, and Sunburst, and 
And my grandfather, I've got a picture of him in my album, 19 and 10, he's 17 years old, on Mount Mitchell building a railroad to get the timber out, him and a steel driving crew. This is the steel driving crew on Mount Mitchell. This man here is Emerson Wheeler. This is his dad, Sam Wheeler. He was the foreman. This is his son, Jasper Wheeler. He's what they call a shaker. See the piece of steel in his hand? Oh, here's another shaker. The steel's uh, driven uh, deeper. And you can see the hammer handle here, how crooked it is. And, uh, this is my grandpa Spurgeon Phillips, at, uh, 17 years old. And this is uh, Spencer Rice and Cephas Sarrington. This is Spurgeon's brother here on Mount Mitchell cutting balsam timber. This man has a measuring stick and they've got their, their saws and axes and the, uh, that's pictures taken about 19 and uh, 17 on Mount Mitchell. These men here were creating the road for these men to get their logs out. Now that's my great, great grandfather, Robin Phillips. Uh, at that time, he lived on the Cane River. His wife was Murray Beaver from Pensacola. Yeah, my grandfather told me a story about uh, my great grandfather had handed it down. He was he was born in 1864, and he was about six years old, and his uh, Robin Phillips had a hog hung on the banks of Cane River, and uh, so they heard some dogs coming, and uh, they was after a deer, and the deer was more afraid of the dogs than it was the man who hadn't seen Robin, so uh, the deer jumped on the river, started swimming towards him, and he already had his knife in his hand. He went out and got it by the horns and killed it and brought it in, and all the children was happy because they had a hog and a deer both hanging for, for winter. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, my great, great, great grandma, uh, Murray Beaver from Pensacola, Joshua Phillips' his mother. And the right hand picture is my great, great, great grandma, uh, Norton. She was the one that was uh, five years old and witnessed the Shelton Law Massacre, Melissa Norton. Hey guys, Tim Barnwell from the Face of Appalachia. Glad to have you along today. What a great album Adelon Phillips has put together. It's been really fun to sit down with him and flip through the pages because every photo seems to elicit a new story from his family history. I met him many years ago when I was working on my own Earth's Fur a Brow book. And I was amazed at the detail that he could remember and the descriptions of everything he had about the places where he grew up and the people he knew. Recently, I went and sat down with him at his family farm in the remote Shelton Laurel section of Madison County, North Carolina. And we spoke about his family history and he sang some ballads, which was an unexpected treat. Next up, he'll talk about the Shelton Laurel Massacre, which happened at the height of the Civil War in January of 1863. Click on the links below if you're interested in learning more about this tragic event that led to the area being called Bloody Madison. Now, let's get back to Antelope. Back there, there was uh, old man David Shelton went in there about 220 years ago and uh, started a generation, and there wasn't any schools prior to the Civil War, and they didn't... 90% uh, of them were illiterate. They didn't understand what the war was over. and They didn't even know uh, it was going over until the, the military come in there. I found out that they was dodging the draft and the, the military base was at Mars Hill and they, uh, well, the men come to Marshall to get uh, salt to make our moonshine and, the, and sugar and uh, and they uh, declared them outlaws. At the time of the war, you don't have any local law. It's what's called martial law. It's just ruled by the military. So they uh, ruled them outlaws and sent a detachment of men back there. They rounded up about 50 of them. And the women got the soldiers all drunk. It was about 10 degrees and everybody escaped. So they would uh, lay the women's babies out in the snow or uh, put the women's hands behind them and pull them up over an apple tree limb or something and that was so painful they'd scream you could hear them three or four miles and about 14 or 15 of them give themselves back up and come in and they told the family that they was going to take them to Marshall or Asheville one and put them in jail but they got down the road about a mile and they heard their rifles firing and they had 
lined them up and shot them in the back of the head of those 58 caliber rifles and, and laid them along the ditch line and dug the bank of the road off on them. In a couple of days then, the old military man, leader, he gave the people permission. They dug their bodies up and tuck them up and put, uh, dug a mass grave and put all the bodies in it. And uh, about 1960 or something, a couple of preachers, they got uh, a monument, about two, 400 pound stones, and put their names on them and put it to the heads of the graves. It's on the Allegheny branch on the Shelton Law. That's a man's name, Jonah Blankenship. The Willis Norton's daughter, Uddy, he had uh, Finey as his uh, illegitimate daughter. So she had uh, two children in 1925, and she found them both dead in the bed, and she uh, thought her mother had killed the babies. And she killed herself. She's buried at the Medigap Cemetery. That guitar was bought in 1925 for $3.95, and they, they still have that guitar. It was a lot of money, wasn't it? That's my great, 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 great grandma. She was an Indian, Delaney McCone. They put her grandson in her lap told her they're going to take his, to hold him, they take his picture and they tricked her and moved the camera up. That's the only picture they've ever had of her. They trick her to get him. She lived back on the mountain about two miles from here where she was born and never, she lived to be about 104 and never to go to Marshall. It's eight miles away. She just stayed back there on the mountain. So I understand you do some ballad singing? Yeah. They have what they uh, call a decoration in the mountains. They, Oh, used to, uh, they'd have it on the 30th of May. People would come to the mountains, but uh, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, so many people got to get in uh, uh, public jobs that they wouldn't come through the week, I guess, so then they changed it to setting it on Sundays. And the old people had uh, learnt their songs here in Appalachia, and about everybody sang by different speed and tone, and they didn't... Uh, know anything about music, they just sang a song and uh, learnt several songs from the old folks. And uh, it's uh, some of the old songs, maybe 200 years old, I learnt from those old uh, men and women that sang them at the decorations and I try to copy that same style of uh, singing and uh, uh, I get uh, invited to sing at a few churches and funerals around, some of the old ballads and old gospel songs. Oh, this song's about uh, this woman that uh, operated on the liquor still in a home for wayward girls. The law come to shut her still down and she fought it out with them and was killed. Tied Levis Darling, her title was Darling Cora. Well, the first time I seen Darling Cora, she was sitting by the deep blue sea. She had a bottle of liquor in her hand and a banjo on her knee. Well, wake up, wake up, darling Cora. What makes you sleep so sound? The revenue officers are coming, gonna tire your liquor still down. Run away, run away, darling Cora. Run away, run away and hide. The highway robbers are a coming. Gonna tear your playhouse down. Well, darling Cora raised her pistol. The officers did the same. After the sound of gunfire, darling Cora lay on the ground. Well, Go dig a hole, dig a hole in the meadow. Dig a hole in the cold, cold ground. Go dig a hole, dig a hole in the meadow. Gonna lay darling Cora down. Don't you hear them bluebirds a-singing? 
Can't you hear that mournful sound? They're preaching, darling, Cora's funeral in some lonesome graveyard ground. Well, the last time I seen darling Cora, she was standing by the deep blue sea, had a bottle of liquor in her hand and a forty-four gun wrapped around her. Darling Cora. This is uh, Dan Norton, when it was in the First World War, and baby, he's the one that got killed with a tree. This, this is their first cousin, Samson Landers. He killed the, the Stantons on Shelton Laurel, killed his brother. The next day, they're going to play the Laurel. It was just a dirt road at that time, and they pulled the road, across the road in front of him for a showdown, and, and he got out and shot two of them down, and the other one took off running, and he shot him running. So he killed three of the Stantons with a, a 38 to squeeze handle pistol. He's got his logging leggings on. <laughs> I used to dress good for those days. There's not many people had suits. They were timber cutters and they make about $2 a day. A good hand. Uh, my grandpa was working him in 1929 and uh, he quit work in November to come home and uh, get his winter's wood. There's a sunburst. And they offered Sampson, he was such a good hand to fix saws, they offered another dollar and a half a day to stay and fix the saws. So he agreed, and he had a thousand dollars. He's worked out two or three dollars a day. And my grandpa was going to ride the bus from a Sunburst to Marshall, and he's, uh, Sampson thought he might maybe get drunk or uh, somebody rob his money, so he sent that thousand dollars by my grandpa to put in the bank for him at Marshall. That was trusting him a lot, wouldn't it? Yeah. This is a great uncle, and uh, him and his wife and son, the, the 1918 flu killed them. They buried down the road here, half a mile in the Shelton Cemetery. They lived up in a house about 500 foot above us. And that's another brother, Harlan Shelton. His family lives on Spillcorn. Uh, he, sh he shot a Hensley man in 1920 and had to build four. 14 year in prison. This and here's another brother, Pete. He, he took a load of uh, apples to, to South Carolina, went to, and to buy some liquor from a man, got in a shootout with him and, and uh, was killed. And his neighbor brought him back in a wagon. He's buried up on Laurel about three miles from here. This is his son, Lee. He killed Walter Buckner on uh, Sprankles Creek in 1940. And, uh, some, uh, some more of Madison's history. You were telling me about uh, fox hunting. Tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, that was a, a recreation that men done for 200 years here in the mountains. They'd take their dogs out once or twice a week and uh, take them a little fat back meat. A few of them would take their uh, uh, a little moonshine to drink, get away from the house, away from their wives, and they'd let their dogs run to one o'clock or something, they'd lay down and go to sleep and uh, wake up and uh, call their dogs and head back home. So you said there was a, a call? To... Yeah, you go back, uh, your young dogs, uh, old dogs, he's used to hunting, he can find his way back home, used to the area, but a young dog, you take him to some horse where he didn't know where he was at, and he'd run till two or three o'clock, and he'd give out, and he'd just lay down and go to sleep. Go back the next day and you take your horn with you. And that, that horn, you can hear it three or four miles and you honk it about seven times. And then that gets his dog's attention and he will uh, divert his attention to that distance, the area he heard the horn come from. And then he could, uh, you could, you could call him Yodel Farm and he'd come to you then. <laughs> On this channel, I hope to continue to honor the people, vibrant culture, and strong traditions of Appalachia.